how did you get your mindset into this alter ego to be comfortable being Black Mama? Like, how, how did that happen? It's a good separation for me, you know, emotionally, to be able to put myself in a place where at practice, when I'm training and during games, I switch my mind to something else. I switch my mode to something else, right? And for me, it's the equivalent of Maximus, Desmus, Meridius, and Gladiator picking up the dirt, smelling the dirt, it's go time. Right? So that was my mental switch. It's like an actor getting ready for a film. You gotta put yourself in that cage. When you're in that cage, you are that character. And when you leave there, it's something completely different. When I'm in that cage, bro, don't fucking touch me. Don't talk to me. Just <laughs> leave me alone. So what is your recruiting approach? So if you're sitting down with me, I'm somebody you really want, you really want me on the team. What's your approach to recruit me? You want first place, come play with me. You want second place, go somewhere else. <laughs> um, you know, trivial things weren't gonna pull my attention. It had to be things, weren't gonna pull my attention. It had to be things that were, I had a purpose. I wanted to be one of the best basketball players to ever play and anything else that was outside of that lane, I didn't have time for. At, at what age did that goal become crystal clear? That I, made, I made that deal with myself at 13 years old. At 13 years 13 old? 13 years old, that's you the deal I made. Clear about it. Crystal clear. And where did inspiration come from? Um, the love of the game. The love of the game, the challenge. Like, I, I would watch Magic play, I'd watch Michael play, and I would see them do these unbelievable things, and I'd say, you know, can I get to that level? I don't know, but let's find out. Let's find out. Right, so, you know, basketball for me was the most important thing. So everything I saw, whether it was TV shows, whether it was books I read, people I talked to, everything was done to try to learn how to become a better basketball player. Everything, everything. And so when you have that point of view, then literally the world becomes your library to help you to become better at your craft. I had a kill list. And so, you know, they used to do these rankings. It was Street and Smith basketball rankings. And I was nowhere to be found, because I was like 6'4", scrawny, like 160 pounds soaking wet. So I was like 57 on the list. And so I would look at 56, 55, all the way up to number one, who these players are, what club teams they played for. So when we go on an AAU travel circuit, I, I gotta hunt them down, right? And so that became my mission in high school, is to check off every other person, all those 56 other names, hunt them down and knock them down. That was it. Get a target on them right off the bat. That was it. Very simple, that's unbelievable. So when you played at 13, I would size you up and see what your strengths and weaknesses are. How do you approach the game? Are you silly about it? Are you goofy about it? Are you good at it just because you're bigger and stronger than everybody else? Right, it was your actual thought and skill that you put into it. Right? And when I'd play, I'd play to my weaknesses. I wouldn't play to my strengths, I'd play to my weaknesses. Because when you're playing summer basketball, there's so many games. So there's not a lot of skill work being done. So when are you gonna get better? Right? When you're playing in competition situations, you're only playing to your strengths. Why? Because you wanna win. Right? So what I would do, I was work on the things during those games that I was weak at. Left hand, pull up jump shot, uh, post game. So I have a strategy. And so then, fast forward to when I'm 17, and my game is completely well-rounded, and that player at 13, that I saw at 13, is still doing the same shit at 17. Now you got a problem. 
Shaq was whispering something in your ear. What did Shaq say to you in that moment? I don't even know. You don't remember? No, I wasn't paying attention. Got you know, like, like it, it was, you know, like for me, it, it's maybe it's a little like asshole of me or whatever, but whatever. Um, he was like, he was trying to whisper encouraging things. I was like, I'm fucking fine. <laughs> okay. I shot five air balls on national TV in front of millions of people that cost us a series. And I'm 18. I'm fine, dude. How do you get their mental? How does somebody get there mentally with that public humiliation to some people hurts them and they don't come back because, you know, there was a player, Barbosa. I don't know if you remember Barbosa. Yeah. Of course you remember, of course. He was extremely talented for good, quick first step, but they said he wouldn't do well when the spotlight was on. Yeah. How did you get mentally and emotionally so strong where it doesn't bother you? Well, you know, it's, you got to look at the reality of the situation. You know, like for me, it's not, you know, you, you kind of got to get over yourself. It's not about you, man. Like, okay, you feel embarrassed. You're not that important. <laughs> get over yourself. Yeah, that's where you go. Get over yourself, right? Like you're worried about how people may perceive you and like you're walking around and it's embarrassing because you shot five air balls. Get over yourself, right? And then after that, it's okay, well, why did those air balls happen? Got it. High school, year before, we played 35 games, max, right? Week in between, spaced out, plenty of time to rest. In the NBA, it's back to back to back to back to back to back to back. I didn't have the legs. So you look at the shot, every shot was online. Every shot was online, but every shot was short. Right? I gotta get stronger. Uh, I gotta train differently. The weight training program that I'm doing, I gotta tailor it for an 82 game season mm -hmm. so that when the playoffs come around, my legs are stronger and that ball gets there. So I look at it with rationale and say, okay, well, the reason why I shot air balls is because my legs aren't there. I go, well, next year they'll be there. That was it. Done. Done. Yeah. What was really your work ethic like, and for how long did you stay disciplined? Um, well, I mean, I mean, every day. I mean, since you know, 20 years. I mean, it was an everyday process and trying to figure out strengths and weaknesses. For example, jumping ability. Man, my vertical was a 40. It wasn't a 46 or a mm -hmm. 40, 45. Um, my hands are big, but they're not massive. Right? So you got to figure out ways to strengthen them so your hands are strong enough to be able to palm a ball and do the things that you need to do. Uh, quickness, I was quick, but not insanely quick. I was fast, but not ridiculously fast, right? So I had to rely on skill a lot more. I had to rely on angles a lot more. I had to study the game a lot more. And, uh, but I enjoyed it though. So like from the time I was, I can't remember when I started watching the game, I studied the game mm -hmm. and it just never changed. What was the conversation like with your wife to say, listen, this is the schedule? Because look, you know, some entrepreneurs, they're coming home at night and late, oh my gosh, my wife is upset because I came home at 11.30. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness, what a <laughs> sacrifice I'm making. You know, yeah. this life's, you know, I don't know if I can do this. Sure. You're on the road nine months out of the year, if you sure. especially played the Olympics, you won two gold medals, so you're doing that on the off season and you're trying to get that part going and training for doing your camps. What is the conversation life like with your wife and kids to say, listen, this is what I'm doing. How did that conversation go? Well, with the kids, it's different. So, like, the communication with, the, with our children is that, you know, Pops is working hard. This is the level of attention to detail you need to have in everything you do. So it's, it's setting the example. Same thing with my wife. My wife's a stay-at-home wife. It's the hardest job, man. Right? So she works really hard at that. I mean, it's... You know, and so her attention to detail with that as well are examples for our children. And then for my wife, it's, you know, she's as competitive as I am. So she's just like, listen, man, if you're going to be out here training eight hours a day, if you're going to spend nine months out of the year away from your family, you better fucking win the championship. <laughs> what are we doing this for? <laughs> what, what are we doing? That. What are we doing? I love that. You know? Um, but it's a balancing act, and that's the thing that's important is understanding that we have to have so much energy because for like Natalia and Gianna when they were babies, especially Natalia because they're doing prime years, um, and I go to practice and I, I train and you know, I play the game and you know, I come home and I'd be sore and I'd be tired. And she wants to go swimming, she wants me to take her to the park, she wants to just jump on my back or whatever the case may be. You can't say, I'm too tired, I'm going to lay down. Mm. 
That's not fair. She don't know what the hell's going on, right? And if this was a game, you'd suck it up and play. I play games with the flu. I play games with 102 degree fever, man. Powerful. You can't do that. That is can't. so powerful. Right? You gotta be on, man. You're playing against the Golden State Warriors. Score is 107, 109. You guys are close to getting into the playoffs. You know exactly what happens in the game. You go up, you're about to take your shot, and then all of a sudden, boom, yeah. Achilles happens, right? Friend of mine, Nima, he is here just to listen to you play ball. And he told me, he says, Patrick, I don't think you understand. He says, when I told my Achilles in high school, he says, four friends of mine dragged me to my house. I was crying from there straight to the hospital. He says, I have no clue how the hell this guy did it. He went and hit the free throws, and then he walked off the stage. Yeah. And he got the surgery now. Yeah. How the hell do you tolerate that kind of pain? Uh, you know, I, I, I use this, I, I tell this example, and I think this is the best way to explain it. Um, you know, you have a, a hamstring injury, you pull your hamstring really, really badly, you can barely walk. Right, let alone play anything. Soccer, basketball, volleyball, whatever it is. You can't do anything. Doctor tells you go home, sit up on the couch, rest your hammy, right? Stay off of it, don't get up, no sudden movements. You're at home, all of a sudden a, a fire breaks out in the home. Right? Your kids are upstairs, you know, wife is wherever she may be, you know, shit's going down. Right? I'm willing to bet that you're gonna forget about your hamstring, you're gonna sprint upstairs, you're gonna grab your kids, you're gonna make sure your wife's good, you're getting out of that house, right? Hamstring be damned. You're not gonna feel your hamstring, right? And, and the reason is because the lives of your family are more important than the injury of your hamstring. And so when the game is more important than the injury itself, you don't feel that damn injury. Not at that time. When I, I went in the trainer's room, my kids are in there, and, you know, they're looking at you and stuff, and I'm looking at them, and I'm like, you know, it's all right, dad's gonna be all right, he'll be fine, he'll be all right, he'll be all right, he'll be all right. Be all right. And as a parent, you gotta set the example. You gotta set the example. This, this is another obstacle. This obstacle cannot define me. It's not gonna cripple me. It's not gonna be responsible for me stepping away for the game that I love. I'm gonna step away on my own terms. And that's when the decision was made that, you know what, I'm doing it, I'm doing it.